please continue eating, but stop talking. <laughs> Good morning. On behalf of the Seidman College of Business and Grand Valley State University, I'm delighted to welcome you to the SECI Lecture Series. My name is Matt McLogan, and I don't know why Bonnie was, and the Dean were so nice in asking me to do this. It should be Dean Reifel, but here I am. I will try and do it instead. Um, First, I want to begin with an acknowledgement and a thanks to uh, Ambassador Secchia and Joan Secchia for underwriting this event and making it possible. This is the largest turnout for the Secchia Lecture Series in all of 2014. It's also the first one in 2014. <laughs> Peter, thank you. Later in the program, you'll hear from President Haas and, of course, from our guest speaker, but it is now my duty to introduce the introducer. And if there is a more unnecessary task <laughs> in a room where you have come to hear from somebody else, I can't imagine what it is. But we do have a reason for wanting to introduce the introducer, who is a graduate of Grand Valley State University and holds a degree in finance from the Seidman College of Business. And after grabbing uh, both of those accolades, he headed home to northern Michigan and decided to run for the Michigan House of Representatives. Was elected, and his colleagues realized a good thing when they saw it, and they made him the youngest standing chairman of a, of a re regular committee in the history of the Michigan House of Representatives. All of this Frank Foster accomplished by the time he was 23 years old. Now, in the, at the ripe old age of 27, he chairs the Commerce Committee. So if you care about the intersection of <coughs> commerce, government, business, and regulation, Frank's your guy. But he's also here this morning because his 107th district contains th three of the most iconic things Michigan possesses. Little Traverse Bay, the Mackinac Bridge, and Mackinac Island. Yes, Frank Foster is the state representative whose district includes the Grand Hotel. And you know, it is really tough duty every summer, June, July, and August, Representative Foster has to make frequent visits to the island. <laughs> tough duty, but he's up for it. Ladies and gentlemen, State Representative Frank Foster. introduction. Everyone looks so nice today. I was uh, talking with the ambassador trying to figure out how many students and alumni we have, but you're all dressed so well. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, this is a, this is a, a real honor for me. Uh, the largest crowd, my first, at, uh, first time at this uh, type of breakfast. Uh, didn't realize uh, when I was in college that they all started at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> so, you know, I've been uh, lobbying the Secchias uh, pretty hard to, for a 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock start uh, next time so for all of you students. But uh, I also thought uh, when I was invited that this was going to be a different format, I thought I was going to lead a roast of Dan Musser. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after dinner, yeah, we did that at, at last night at dinner. Uh, so today I just get to uh, introduce uh, my friend, a great... Uh, businessmen in my district, a great citizen uh, of the state of Michigan, uh, R.D. Musser III. Dan Musser is president of the Grand Hotel, a historic 385-room hotel built in 1887 on Michigan's Mackinac Island, where no motorized vehicles are permitted. Along with his sister Mimi, Dan represents the third generation of Musser ownership and operation of the Grand Hotel, the world's largest summer resort. Dan is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the Grand Hotel, which include overseeing front desk, convention services, food, beverage, sales and marketing, housekeeping, maintenance, and recreation. Dan started full-time at the hotel in 1986. The year I was born, Dan. <laughs> and, uh, And he worked, his, uh, he worked his way up through every uh, department uh, to gain a thorough understanding of all aspects of running the hotel. He served as kitchen assistant, bellman, bartender, bar manager, front desk clerk, front desk manager, reservations manager, vice president. Uh, he, he was named president in 1989. Active in the hotel industry, Dan is the former chairman of the Michigan Hotel, uh, Motel and Resort Association and former chairman of the Resort Committee of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Dan was appointed to the Michigan Travel Commission in 1998 
and was reappointed by uh, Governor John Engler in 1998. He's the past and current alderman of the city of Mackinac Island, serves, serves on the board of the Mackinac Island Tourism Bureau and Michigan Retailers Association. He is the chair of the Mackinac Island Convention and Visitors Bureau, president of the Mackinac Island Community Foundation, the list goes on. Also, the chair of, or also sits on the Mackinac Island Bridge Authority Board. Dan received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Albion College, Albion, Michigan, 1986, and an honorary doctorate of business from Northern Michigan University in Marquette, Michigan in 2012. He lives on Mackinac Island during the season uh, and in Portland, Oregon during the remainder of the year with his wife, Marley, children, Amelia R.D. Musser IV, Quattro, uh, Matilda Maverick, and Cecilia. And I was actually, I was just preparing some notes this morning and I was watching ESPN and I forgot that uh, Dan also is a, a part owner of uh, the world champion uh, dog, Sadie. A couple, was it 2011 or? Yeah, so uh, quite an accomplished man. Uh, my true honor to introduce you today. So welcome to stage. Thank you, Frank, and uh, th thank, uh, thank you, Ambassador, and Mrs. Secchia for, for having me here. Um, and and it, it's truly an honor to, to be able to speak to you today. Um, it's, it's great to see a, a good mix of business professionals and, and students here as well uh, this morning. Um, and I'm especially pleased to see some former guests, and I hope maybe some future guests uh, in the crowd as well. Um, but I also want to point out we have three Grand Hotel or we have three Grand Valley alumni who are here today, uh, who are full-time employees of Grand Hotel, who make a wonderful contribution to the, to the hotel and our team, uh, and they're here this morning. And I'd like if you could stand up, uh, uh, Chloe Combs, Audrey Blitzman, and um, Mike Cannon, all alumni. And, uh, Thank you for what you do for the hotel, and uh, thank you to the university for, for producing this uh, wonderful uh, group of individuals, and hopefully many more to come. But uh, <clears throat> when I was asked uh, for a title for my remarks, um, I chose sustaining a grand vision over three centuries, because uh, we opened our doors uh, long before automobiles, uh, interstate highways, or, or airplanes, uh, which, which means it was not <laughs> nearly as accessible as it, as it today, it, although it's not overly accessible. But, <laughs> uh, but at that time, our clientele was made up of uh, summer vacationers uh, that arrived uh, either by lake steamer uh, or by rail uh, and generally stayed for the entire summer. Um, in the intervening 127 years, uh, Mackin Island and Grand Hotel become more accessible uh, than they were obviously in 1887. In that time, our season expanded from two months to six. Our annual guest list has expanded from a relatively small group of uh, wealthy families from the, from the, from the Midwest um, to, uh, the, that spent the entire summer with us to over 130,000 guests, uh, visitors from all ages and all walks of life. Uh, the stay of an average of two and a half days to, to three days in our peak season. Um, I would say that if, if the students here today were assigned to create a successful business model, you wouldn't follow ours. <laughs> we're a hospitality venue located nearly 300 miles uh, away from the closest major metropolitan area. Uh, we're an island. Uh, which means you can't drive up to our front door. Uh, we're closed six months of the year right now, uh, which means we can't generate revenue this time of year. Um, and, all, and that also means we, each spring we hire upward of 700 employees uh, before we can re even reopen our doors. Uh, Mackin Island's year-round uh, population's just shy of 500. <coughs> So even if we hire, even if we hired every, everyone on Mac and I, senior citizen, child, we would not have enough staff to, to make uh, our, our facility operate. And yet, all of this fortunately works. Um, we have a loyal team, of skilled and dedicated employees, some are here today, um, who come back year after year. Uh, we, we recently celebrated our 125th anniversary 
um, two summers ago, and we decided, I decided to honor all of the employees that have been with us for more than 10 years, and ironically, it, there were 125 <laughs> individuals on our 125th anniversary that have been with us for more than 10 years. Some have uh, been with us for more than 20. Um, and we literally could not do what we do without those individuals. Um, we obviously have, and fortunately have, a loyal uh, family of guests that come at, back year after year and uh, obviously could not do w without them as well. <laughs> Um, but because of the quality of our staff, level of service that we try to maintain, uh, we're listed annually as one of the top hotels in the world uh, by such publications as Travel and Leisure Magazine and Connie Nance Traveler. Um, so what's our secret? Uh, you know, how, how are we successful with such an unorthodox business model? Um, I see our bankers here. and. Maybe they're still asking why, why this is so, but, <laughs> but to me, uh, the, the story of the hotel uh, from the beginning to today is a story about people with a vision, uh, people who have followed their heart to do something they loved, uh, people who have put long hours and hard work to make it succeed, uh, people who have maintained a sense of continuity and timelessness. Uh, at the same time, adjusting uh, to changes in the world around them. Um, this vi vi vision began in the late 1800s with uh, Francis Stockbridge, a uh, lumber baron, as you well know, eventually become United States Senator. Um, he loved, fortunately for us, loved the island. Um, he believed the island needed a major hotel that fully utilized uh, the island's beauty. Um, and so he purchased the site uh, that the hotel sits on today in 1882 um, because of the view of the Straits and the, its location. Um, five years later, he found a builder and arranged financing for its construction uh, for, from three major uh, transportation companies that served the island at that time, the Michigan Central Railroads, Grand Rapids and Indiana, Indi Indiana Railroad, and the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company. And all of those transportation companies, kind of like the uh, Canadian Pacific, Pacific hotels that uh, exist today, uh, they were just interested in creating a new destination to bring people to. They weren't really interested, I guess, fortunately for my family, in the hospitality business. They were just interested in creating a new spot. Um, and so they did. In the fall of 1886, uh, the foundation where the hotel sits today was built. Um, high on the, on the bluff there over the Straits of Macada. And during the course of the winter of 1886 and 1887, uh, more than one million feet of Michigan white pine was milled in Sheboygan, uh, brought the island over the ice. Apparently, they had a cold winter like we are this year, <laughs> and uh, stockpiled at the base of the hill where our tennis courts sit today. In, in the spring of 1887, uh, 400 carpenters living in a tent city uh, next to the lumber at the base of the hill, construct the main facade and the structure that really you, you see today. Their, their goal was to complete it in 90 days, uh, and they failed. They completed 93 days. And on July 10th, in 1887, the hotel opened its doors for our first guest, which is a remarkable feat if you look at what we build today and how long it takes. They built that facility in uh, basically a spring. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm proud to say in intervening years, uh, through two world wars, uh, one Great Depression and the most recent uh, Great Recession, uh, we haven't missed a season. Um, my, my family's history with the hotel started in 1919, uh, which means we've involved the hotel for about three quarters of its existence. My great uncle, uh, William Stuart Woodfill, traveled to northern Michigan from Indiana for the first time in 1918 uh, because he suffered from hay fever and traveling to northern Michigan was the fashion to escape such maladies at that time. In the first year, he worked at the Arlington Hotel in Petoskey that is now gone. But the, the manager there said, you know, if you're really serious about this business, you, you should go work um, for Mr. Ballard up at Grand Hotel. He's a, he's a real, and I remember my great uncle saying, he's a real goer. You know, you, you should go see him. And so anyway, the next year, my great uncle did. Um, 
and he worked as a, as a uh, clerk at the front desk, um, which then, and I feel still today, is the nerve center of any, any, any hotel. Um, but he approached Mr. Ballard, the then owner of the hotel, and said, I'll work for no pay for the season. And uh, pay me what you think I'm worth at the end of the season. And that brashness, or whatever it was, struck a chord with Mr. Ballard, and, and um, he, he stayed on. And they became good friends, but more importantly, I, he became my great uncle's mentor in the business. Um, and, and following Mr. Ballard's death in 1923, um, he went to, into partnership with heirs of uh, Mr. B the estate, uh, as well as the auditor. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, with all due respect to Deloitte and others that are here, he hated it. <laughs> he hated to have partners. He, he had very specific ideas of what he thought uh, should happen at the hotel, and he didn't like having to deal with someone else. <laughs> and so he sold out and took paper and uh, thought he'd live kind of the life of Riley, if you will. Um, but the stock market crash of, of 29 uh, happened. And he quickly realized that he needed, uh, his paper was worth nothing if we didn't have a, a business that was, you know, uh, viable. Um, so he came back and uh, foreclosed on the hotel. And eventually in March of uh, 1933, in the depths of the Depression, um, he was the sole bidder, as it turned out, in, uh, at auction and took the hotel out of receivership. And, uh, in, in 1969, he, my uncle made a speech um, he, re reflecting on that time, saying that his family and friends were not overly enthusiastic about his idea and decision to purchase the hotel at that point. He, he said, they suggested a bucket be secured, a sterling silver bucket, if it need be to please my expensive taste, and that my money could be put into it and poured down the sink because that would shorten the ordeal of losing my money and make it much more easier. <laughs> but Uncle Stewart had a vision. He followed his heart, and he was doing something he loved and was prepared to work very hard at it. Um, he was also a wonderful promoter. Um, he, he convinced Ripley's of Believe It or Not fame uh, to promote us as the world's largest summer hotel with the largest porch in the world which is something we, we keep saying today. We don't know if it's true or not, but we keep <laughs> saying it. <laughs> but at that time, this nationwide promotion uh, enabled uh, us and him at that time to kickstart our brand uh, to, a, to beyond Detroit, beyond Grand Rapids, beyond you know, Cleveland. And, and it got us kind of uh, beyond what we had done to that date. Um, he also decided, um, which now seems trivial, but he was the first of our of carriage trade hotels to, to take conventions. His peers told him, Stuart, you're, you're crazy. You're going to scare away that wonderful old guest that comes for the season. And they don't want to see the, the Michigan bankers. They don't want to see the Michigan Hospital Association, which make us viable today. Um, and, and yet, he, he did that, and, and, uh, and, and that transition, which, again, looking back, at, you know, now we, we kind of see it, but you have to imagine, he, he was able to see that, that roads were going to, cars were getting better, uh, roads were getting better, uh, the, uh, the, avail, uh, the availability of, of, of flying somewhere and getting somewhere and traveling was going to change, and that was going to change the way that our country um, visited places like us and, and other resorts, but he, he fortunately um, was able to see kind of beyond the, the forest and see that that guest that would come for the summer was going to diminish and that now, you know, our average stay is about two and a half days, two days in the off season and maybe three days in the summer. Um, and, and really that's one of the main decisions he made early on that has also made us viable. Um, he also played a, a key role working with my wife's grandfather, uh, Senator Brown, uh, to uh, help see the Mackinac Bridge was built. Um, at that time, there were a lot of doubters and skeptics regarding the feasibility of connecting the two peninsulas, the bridge, 
with a, with a bridge. And uh, so Uncle Stewart spent a series of winters in Lansing, uh, lobbying and, and uh, uh, individual legislators on behalf of the bridge idea, uh, which he saw as a key economic development in northern Michigan. He spent considerable time researching every ge geographical report in the Straits of Mackinac. I think he made a few up um, th that he could get hands on, but, uh, th but to prove the bridge was a viable uh, it, idea and feasible. Um, then he uh, eventually um, uh, reported to a joint session of legislator in Lansing and presented his case. Um, fortunately, the legislator eventually approved the creation of a bridge authority, which I'm honored to be on today, um, and then later approved the uh, construction of the bridge, which with the use of uh, revenue bonds, uh, which was a concept my uncle came up with and you know, successfully advocated for and, and succeeded with. And th when the bridge opened in uh, 1957, the front page of the Sault Ste. Marie Evening News read, one mad man from Mackinac Island agitated bridge idea back to life when it bogged down in legislators. So that, that was my great uncle. <laughs> uh, the next key person, uh, no doubt, um, uh, with a vision for the hotel was my father, uh, also Dan Musser. He went uh, to work for my great uncle in 1951, uh, at the same time he started college. Um, my uncle told my father, um, whose own father, my grandfather, passed away, that he'd pay for his college um, if he agreed to work with, for Grand Hotel for two years, uh, with the understanding that after that two years, they liked each other, they'd, they'd stick together, and apparently it worked, because he, they had stuck around. <laughs> um, and in 1960, my dad uh, became president of the hotel, uh, and he brought uh, a vision, I believe, uh, of transferring the hotel, which was complemented by my, my mom's uh, love of beauty uh, that I think is reflected, we hope, uh, throughout the hotel, uh, whether in your guest rooms, our public space, or our grounds. Um, and he began approving uh, the hotel immediately, making changes uh, that continue today. For instance, uh, when he first took over, there were 120 rooms that had shared a bath. And I can tell you as a young front desk clerk, that was a lot of fun trying to rent those. <laughs> um, but by 1970, uh, there were no. He had gotten rid of all of those. And when he took over, we had 200 rooms uh, and began a series of expansions that have almost doubled our, our capacity. Uh, our current total of 100, uh, 386, and uh, we're adding two, two rooms this year. Um, and he also lengthened our season from uh, three months to uh, six that it is currently. But he also brought a, a real commitment to excellence and a refusal to cut corners and always had a close attention to detail. Um, one of his rituals was a, a, a room by room tour of the hotel before we opened. Um, it was a tradition that we continued last year, uh, the first year since 1951 that uh, he wasn't there, um, but one that will continue. He's also ha had been known in the hotel to write um, up to 50 or 60 notes with uh, Chloe's help and others' help to uh, <laughs> staff and uh, 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 pointing out items that needed immediate attention every day. Um, a reporter once, a visiting reporter once said, you know, it seemed after watching my dad walk around and what we do, um, he said that we seem to pay attention, incredible attention to detail. My dad's response was, this is a detailed business. Um, and it is. Um, but the bottom line is that he saw the hotel, Grand Hotel, as a state treasure. Um, and our family role as being caretakers of this unique jewel. And I, I grew up watching all this. Um, I, I watched my father work incredibly long hours for six months out of the year. And I thought, this is a crazy business. Um, I've always liked numbers. Um, so between my sophomore year and junior year of college, I started to work at the Board of Trade in Chicago, thinking that uh, commodities trader might be a better lifestyle than and it would fit my knack for numbers uh, than what we do. But I realized pretty quickly um, 
that whatever you want to do, if you want to do it well, you're going to put a lot of time into it, you're going to put a lot of effort into it, and you're going to work really hard at it. And um, it also occurred to me at that point that I liked the hotel business, and I liked our hotel. I liked um, interacting with the wide range of guests that we are fortunate to have. Um, I love the opportunity to meet and work with a wide range of staff members um, from literally all over, it, from our great state, the United States, and, and literally the world. Um, and um, as Frank uh, Foster and I talked about last night, uh, there's worse places to spend your summer and raise a family than Mac and Island. Um, but I also like to be able to, you know, to uh, implement my own vision uh, and hopefully continuing a legacy of the hotel. In recent years, we focused on adding family-friendly uh, amenities and offerings so families with young children uh, would start coming and create our hopefully next generation of guests. And I'm proud to say that we've accomplished that. Um, there are uh, some other uh, innovations uh, that we've uh, as well. This, this last year, we partnered with another Michigan business uh, from this neck of the woods, Hudsonville Ice Cream, ice cream to open uh, Sadie's Ice Cream Parlor at the east end of the building. Um, uh, it offers an opportunity not only for hotel guests, but also uh, for non-guests to literally get a taste of the hotel, if you will. And um, for a flower shop that had previ previously was in that spot, we've moved inside the hotel, so a little bit like self Bridges uh, department store in, uh, in, in London, you know, by moving the flowers, when you first walk in, you, you smell, you see, uh, all, all, you know, you see the floors working out, you smell it. It's, I think, a wonderful welcoming to the hotel at that point. And um, it's been a great success this last summer, and obviously we're hopeful for another one this year. <coughs> this year, um, we've started a three winter program that will eventually will. Uh, uh, produce uh, seven two-bedroom suites on the fourth floor, um, uh, all with adjoining parlors. Um, we're finding that this level of qual quality um, product and accommodations is now being sought after again after our recession uh, by the traveling public, and we plan to meet that demand. Um, we're excited this year uh, to bring one one-bedroom suite, and um, um, naming after in honor my father um, um, uh, because of his passing away last year. But, uh, I, you know, we talked about this idea for the last 20 years. And it's, fine, it's nice to finally be doing it. <laughs> um, but the Muster Suite will uh, provide a wonderful view of the west end of the island, uh, the Mackinac Bridge, St. Ignace, Mackinac City, and basically the entire Straits area. And will be a wonderful addition to the hotel. Um, but it, I think it's an example of what we were trying to do and continually trying to improve what we have um, and, uh, and, and grow. Um, on, on your way out, and not, not that I'm saying you should leave, but uh, uh, you'll, you'll see some images of uh, our blueprints of the, of the new suite as well as the additional ones we'll build over the next two winters. Um, and I hope you'll take a look at those. Um, but all, all of this... Um, you know, some of our visions are un remain unchanged. Uh, we've always asked, much to the ambassadors, uh, doesn't like it, uh, <laughs> gentlemen to wear a coat and tie and ladies dressed in their finest after 6.30 at night, um, and the governor. <laughs> to name a few important people in our state, maybe, maybe we're on a wrong track or I don't know. <laughs> but we've always felt that it creates an atmosphere uh, that is, well, certainly unique in, in today's world, um, but I, I believe uh, that it's still viable and has a place for us. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a niche uh, there, and, and it's one that we don't intend on changing. Uh, my dad always said, uh, it doesn't cost us a dime to ask you to put a coat and tie on, but it changes the atmosphere of, our, of, the, of the dining room and the parlor um, in, in a way that, you know, you, you can't uh, any other way. Um, but all that being said, I'd like to also recognize that, uh, you know, the, the traveling pu public has changed. Um, and not everyone appreciates that formal dining experience. And 
because of that, uh, in recent years, we've had added several options um, with a, a wide, really a wide variety of food options that are ca at a casual setting that are part of our meal plan and, and, and room rate. Um, but we found, we found that introducing uh, added value like this and yet keeping focused on what the basics of what we do, good clean rooms, uh, good honest food that's uh, professionally prepared and served in a friendly way uh, that we can succeed. And um, so I guess what is the lesson of all this? Um, I've learned one of the most powerful Americans in the 20th century was Bernard, and I can't really pronounce his last name, but it's Barack, I think. <laughs> but he was a financial genius who became a multimillionaire before he was 30, uh, back in the day when a million dollars was actually a million dollars, I guess. Um, but he spent much of his life after that advising presidents from uh, Wilson to Franklin Roosevelt to, to President Kennedy on economic manners, uh, matters as well as other issues that called for his wisdom. And at the age of 87, he made this observation that I noted um, that he had seen in his life. He, he, I witnessed a whole succession of technological revolutions, but none of them have done away with the need for character in the individual and ability or the ability to think. And I think that sums up what has made the hotel so successful through the years. Uh, leaders with strong character, uh, the ability and think and a willingness to follow their heart. Um, I obviously hope to follow in that mode um, and with your help, we can. But uh, we, I look forward to and I'm confident that we'll be around to see the next 22nd century. So thank you for the time this morning and I'd certainly welcome any questions if, if there are any. JC? Yeah, the Musta family has, has become the repository, or the record keeper of a lot of Michigan history up in New York. And I'm wondering if you have uh, an answer to a question. How did Mackinac Island become the, uh, known for its fudge? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and one of my best friends is, uh, is Arriva. And, uh, and uh, another, my fraternity brother, is uh, Murdoch's Fudge. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say there's some secret ingredient, but I, I you know, originally it was saltwater taffy that, that ironically uh, was sold on Mackin Island, which we I have no salt water, but, um, <laughs> but around the turn of the century, a fudge became the, the thing. And I, and I think it's our climate. It holds up, you know, we're... We don't put this in the brochure, but sometimes we're cool in July and August. <laughs> <laughs> Do good and, and try to make it work. And I think that's part of our success, those, those two combinations. Dan, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Before I, uh, I give a presento, um, a couple of things that uh, come to mind. First, uh, thank you to Peter and John again for the uh, ability that we have here at Grand Valley to bring professionals uh, that can share their stories, as Dan did this morning with our students, uh, with other members of the community. And that is priceless in many regards, so thank you for that, appreciate that. And Frank, uh, thank you for your leadership. I remember. Seven and a half years ago, when we were around Caroline, you were a junior, uh, president of faculty, excuse me, uh, student senate, and uh, welcoming uh, uh, Marcia and me and my daughter here to Grand Valley, and that's a, a moment in my time that I will always remember. And now to see you uh, with your continued leadership uh, here in the state of Michigan. Thank you uh, very much for what you have accomplished uh, in a uh, relatively short period with a uh, great future ahead as well. So. Thank you again for uh, uh, being who you are. And again, I uh, really appreciate uh, all of you uh, coming here. One of the hallmarks of Grand Valley State University that I've come to appreciate 
is that uh, we're responsive uh, to uh, uh, the community, in this case, uh, to the state. And we know that uh, when we look at uh, the state tourism is uh, one of those uh, industries uh, that can wax and wane, as we know. Uh, but uh, here we do have uh, some particularly important assets. And uh, it, it is uh, one of those uh, ways that we here at Grand Valley with our hospitality program. Uh, what did you say last night, Paul, when in 10 years we've maybe tripled the uh, enrollment? Yeah, and then you started about 100, 150, now 600. And guess what? These folks are getting jobs, too. Not here just in Michigan, many of them are, but uh, we're, we're uh, exporting and keeping talent right here. And so it's uh, us uh, here at Grand Valley to uh, uh, create relevant programs uh, for students who uh, want to see themselves in uh, supporting Michigan and supporting the rest of the nation as well. So I'm uh, real pleased. In fact, we do have uh, some folks from the international uh, community coming, taking our program. As, and it's very unique because it's very uh, hands-on oriented. And so that, again, is, it's uh, part of our role and responsibility to be responsive uh, to the needs uh, of, uh, of our future. And in this case, uh, tourism uh, is one where we are uh, really exercising our resources in a way for the quality of life that we enjoy and bringing people here to Michigan from other parts of the state and other parts of the uh, world. Yes. So it's uh, really great uh, to have, uh, and I do remember, by the way, just as an aside, I do remember seeing Mackinac Island in the summer of 1970 uh, from a Coast Guard cutter. And, I, I, and here I grew up in New York City. I was on an island too called Staten Island. <laughs> Mackinac Island was much different. Uh, but it uh, still uh, uh, struck, uh, it really kept in my mind that, uh, wow, Michigan is really a special, special place. And truly it is. And now with uh, our time here in, in West Michigan, uh, it really continues to be a very, very special place. And with the people that we have uh, here in this room. And uh, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your story. We really do appreciate that uh, uh, so much. Uh, and. Um, uh, just uh, uh, one other sidelight. Um, I mentioned the uh, hospitality program. Uh, right here in, in, uh, in our midst, we've got the urban market. Uh, we're going to be uh, having a little presence over there too, aren't we? Uh, uh, so we're going to, uh, again, look at opportunities where we can. So um, let me uh, stop there. And uh, again, let's uh, say thanks to Dan. Okay, I've got to ask you to open this up, but uh, uh, you represent the Grand Hotel. I represent, represent, and we do, Grand Valley. It's all in our first name. <laughs> Let's stick with that. <laughs> all right, look at that. Athlete after all. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> oh, uh, I'd be remiss to say that don't forget to pick up a box of fudge on the way out. We, uh, we, we brought something from Mackinac that uh, hopefully you'll enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy your day.